Before we start, let me ask anyone and everyone if you will quiet your cell phones. My name is Jane Cunningham. I'm the former state senator from St. Louis County in the west part of the, the county. I'm not going to dwell today on Auditor Schweik's phenomenal resume and experiences, which he has brought literally from the entire world to the state of Missouri. You already know about his work with Ambassador John Bolton at the UN and at the State Department where he fought terrorism, corruption, and narcotics over the globe. Thank you. I introduced, thank you, I introduced Tom Schweik uh, when he spoke to the very active Chesterfield Chamber of Commerce, and I described this broad-based, thrill-packed, real-life adventure that he has lived, much like a character in a spy movie. After the attendees were delightedly uh, entertained by Tom Schweig's stories, the chamber director ended the meeting, and she said, wow, Missouri's own Indiana Jones. <laughs> Now we've been able to see Tom Schweik's capabilities at the state level, and frankly, I don't know of anyone that knows Missouri state government than Tom Schweik better inside and out in this state government because he knows where all the skeletons are buried or used to be buried because no one has been able to fool him, no one has been able to keep information from him. His highly publicized and recognized work as state auditor has been unparalleled and recognized and his innovative ideas like the rapid response team that is deployed when there's suspicion that documents are going to be destroyed and putting government bureaucrats behind bars that have been stealing from the very taxpayers that pay their salary. In fact, he's done such a good job that he ran for auditor without any opposition. That has not happened in the state of Missouri for 140 years. Tom Schweik has the knowledge, the will, and the backbone to be a true leader, to work cooperatively with the legislature, and to get a visionary agenda accomplished that will move Missouri forward and we can all be very proud. On a more personal note, I remember when I first met Tom Schweig. Senator Danforth, for whom I used to work, pulled me aside on the Senate gallery in 2010, and he said, Jane, Tom's more conservative than I am. <laughs> anyway, uh, while that introduction got my attention, I want to say that I have experienced that candidates and many of them just can't walk that talk once they get in office. I've learned that by being burned, and I've developed a tested and proven measuring stick for candidates. It's important to see how office holders respond when they face a vote or an action that may risk their political future, or how they react when they're in pressure. Unfortunately, not many pass that measurement. Yet I've seen Tom Schweik pass that test time and time again. He stands tall when the pressure is on, oftentimes even having to stand alone when he needs to. That's why I stand here today to introduce a man I consider overqualified for any position in this government in this state. A man who has been tested and he has proven that he is unafraid to stand for what is right for what is fair, and for what is just. I fondly call him one tough geek. You call him your state auditor. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the next governor of the great state of Missouri, Tom Schweik. Thank you all for coming here today. I am deeply honored to stand here with you today to announce that I am a candidate for Governor of Missouri. My administration will be about leadership, it will be about realizing our full potential as a state, it will be about healing our wounds, and most of all, my administration will be about cleaning up the rampant corruption in Jefferson City. Over the past year, I have traveled this state in connection with my campaign for re-election as your state auditor. In last November's election, thanks to you, I became the first statewide candidate in Missouri history to win all 114 counties and the city of St. Louis. 
You reelected me with the highest percentage of votes in the history of Missouri's statewide races. I want to thank you and all the voters of Missouri for that vote of confidence. I take the responsibility that you've given me very, very seriously. During the 2014 campaign, everywhere I went, from Cape Girardeau to St. Joseph, Kansas City to St. Louis, Columbia to Springfield to Joplin, literally hundreds of people stopped me. They pulled me aside at Rotary Clubs, Chambers of Commerce, festivals and fairs, and they all had the same concerns. We need stronger leadership in Missouri, we need more honest government, we need fairer economic policies, and we need to improve our struggling schools. As auditor, working with a great team, I've done my best to improve accountability in state and local government. We put in a rapid response team that Jane just mentioned to catch government criminals. We created a government-wide grading system so you know how your elected officials are performing. That we put together an audit follow-up team that's forced important changes in your cities and in your counties. We've helped root out over 30 corrupt government officials stealing taxpayer money. We exposed massive amounts of welfare and child care fraud. We found state and local government riddled with conflicts of interest, nepotism, secrecy, and waste. And we've gotten the offending officials removed and in some cases locked up. And during our audits, thank you, thank you. And during our audits of the four largest school districts in our state and several smaller ones, we identified serious problems from inadequate monitoring of test cheating to millions in stolen property to the illegal promotion of students who cannot read, and we've helped set those districts on the road to financial and performance improvement. But what I also hear, most recently in a letter that I got from almost 200 prominent Republicans around the state, is that it's time to take the next step. It's time to put a true anti-corruption expert in the governor's mansion. Auditing the state is good. Leading the state is going to be even better. So I am running, I am running for governor. I intend to win this election, and you have my word that as governor, I will clean up Jefferson City with a level of intensity, tenacity, transparency, and rigor that this state has never seen before. Now let me start here, among so many friends, making my case to the people of Missouri. Missourians have told me what they want in a governor, and I think they're looking for four basic qualities. First, the people of Missouri want a governor who is highly qualified for the job. We know from the last six years of President Obama what happens when you get somebody in a high position who is not qualified for the job. You get a bad result. The same holds true for our state. Missouri government is a sprawling $27 billion enterprise. It is complex and it resists change. This is not a job for novices. Second, Missourians want a governor who shares their values and whose policies will reflect those values in such areas as education, economic development, agriculture, human life, the Second Amendment, and health care. Third, they want somebody with integrity. They're tired of government being run by political action committees, lobbyists, and consultants. They don't want candidates who are bought and paid for by a single contributor or political machine. Fourth and finally, they want effective communication. You can be well qualified for the job. You can be as honest as there is. You can have good policies in place, but you have to be able to communicate your ideas to the people. Ferguson has shown us that we have to be much better at listening to all the citizens of our state, from protesters to law enforcement advocates. Effective communication is what binds together qualifications, policies, and ethics into one word, and that's leadership. So let me address those issues one by one. First, my qualifications. A lot of you know me well. I'm a fifth generation Missourian. My Missouri roots are very deep. My father's family came to St. Louis in the 1840s and started a business at Six and Market Street, a furniture business that also helped supply people heading west to Kansas City and beyond. I grew up in a military family, in a family that was always staunchly Republican, supporting conservatives from Barry Goldwater to Ronald Reagan. I graduated from the Missouri public school system. I had hair then. Uh, actually, lots of hair. Uh, I, take that one. Uh, I went east to college, Ivy League, but don't hold that against me. That's where I learned to fight with liberals. Um, but I immediately returned home. I practiced law in Missouri for 20 years, conducting internal investigations for companies, rooting out corruption in the private sector and also defending honest companies from government red tape, intrusion, and bureaucracy. I served as a federal prosecutor on the Waco investigation. I wrote three books that were, that were published nationally and internationally by Simon & Schuster and McGraw-Hill on the topics of business, law, finance, and leadership, all subjects that I know very well. President Bush appointed me as Chief of Staff to three United States Ambassadors to the United Nations, including Jack Danforth and John Bolton. Both of them will be campaigning with me throughout this campaign. I'm very honored to have them on the team. I then served as a senior diplomat in the State Department. I did work in such countries as Afghanistan, 
Pakistan, Mexico, China, Nigeria, South Africa. Those gave me some diplomatic skills. I think a good governor has to be tough. I think a good governor has to be aggressive. But you also have to be a diplomat for the state. And at the State Department, I negotiated with everybody from Chinese bureaucrats to Afghan warlords. And I'll tell you, negotiating with Afghan warlords was really good practice for Missouri politics. <laughs> I served as the United States Ambassador for Counter Narcotics and Justice Reform in Afghanistan. We worked very, very closely with the U.S. military and U.S. law enforcement officials. We took a very troubled program in a war zone, reduced opium by 40% in two years, for which I received awards from the White House, the State Department, the DEA, and the CIA. Throughout my public service career, my wife Kathy and children Emily and Thomas were patriots. My kids had to deal with a father who commuted from the UN in New York all the way back to St. Louis. Then I moved into DC for two years, and I made frequent visits to places like Afghanistan. We are a strong family, and don't you think Kathy Schweig is going to make a great first lady of Missouri? <laughs> she is the best part of this ticket, I'm telling you. Uh, I taught at Washington University in St. Louis about law, international relations in Afghanistan. I work well with young people. I think we really need to go the extra mile to bring young people into the fold of the Republican Party. You elected me state auditor in 2010 and again in 2014 with a really great team of career and appointed people. We audited the major state agencies, boards, commissions, cities, counties, elected officials, public universities, school districts. I understand Missouri government, the good, the bad, and the ugly very, very well. So I, I submit to you that as a lawyer, prosecutor, author, diplomat, professor, and your state auditor, I am prepared to lead this state. Now you also need political qualifications. I'm a Republican. We're a conservative state, yet Republicans have only held the governor's mansion four of the last 24 years, and we lost five out of six statewide races in 2012, even though the Republican candidate for president carried our state by 10 points. Missourians don't go for coattails. They require that every candidate prove his or her merit. I believe I have the political qualifications to win as well. First of all, history shows that Missourians elect governors who have proven they can conduct themselves effectively in statewide office. All eight of our last governors, every governor in the modern era, had won statewide before they became governor. I've won statewide twice. Thanks to you, I'm the only Republican to defeat an incumbent Democrat in any statewide race in 40 years. And as I said earlier, the only person ever to carry all 114 counties and the city of St. Louis. I'm a good fundraiser. I'm not dependent on one contributor. My largest contributor, and I was the only statewide official last year running, my largest contributor, we calculated, contributed about 11% of my total. I am not bought and paid for. Winning the, governor's <laughs> winning the governor's mansion is not some sort of political experiment. The Democrats are going with a proven two-time statewide winner who has never lost an election. I, too, am a proven two-time statewide winner who has never lost an election. No other Republican who's running or considering running can say that. Now let me talk about the second thing, values. My, being highly qualified is important, but it's not enough. Republicans need a candidate who shares your values and will craft those values into effective policies. Now I have traditional Republican values. I'm for honest government, small government, and low taxes. I'm pro-life and a strong defender of the Second Amendment and very pro-business. I'm also a very strong advocate of open government and personal privacy. I have never wavered in those values. But I've also shown that I can work well with Democrats. And you know, I received thousands, tens of thousands of Democrat votes in the last two elections. And the reason is simple. As auditor, I've conducted myself in a completely nonpartisan manner. 90% of what a governor does is lead, organize, and manage. And people might disagree with you or me on, say, the Second Amendment. Uh, but if they see you're concerned about them in every other area, that you provide leadership for them too, that you consider their viewpoints, they will support you. I promise to be a governor for all Missourians, all six million of them. Now, my primary opponent has not been consistent in her values. Today I'll, today I'll give you one of many examples to follow. Missouri House Speaker Catherine Hanaway adamantly opposed Missouri's concealed carry le legislation, calling it extreme arrogance, saying we don't want this. She tried to kill Missouri's concealed carry law with amendments. She then voted against it, got a D rating from the NRA, D as in done. Then she flip-flopped when it was to her political advantage and now claims to be pro-Second Amendment. That is a politician with an agenda, not a leader with values. The Republican Party cannot run a candidate for governor who has ever been anti-Second Amendment. And that's particularly true when the Democrat candidate, 
Chris Koster actually supported Missouri's concealed carry law at the very same time Hannaway was opposing it. If the Republican Party runs a candidate who has Second Amendment problems against a Democrat who's solid on Second Amendment, we will lose. Game, set, match. Pull the issue. We have. It's over. But hang on a minute. While Chris Koster has been consistently pro-gun, I admit, when it comes to other issues, he's been both a Republican and a Democrat. He's been pro-life and pro-choice. He's been for Obamacare and he's been against it. And he did not become pro-ethics until he was caught red-handed by the New York Times being anti-ethics. <laughs> Koster, too, will switch positions on a dime. Well, actually, it takes more than a dime. Uh, that is a politician, not a leader. Now let me talk about specific policies that reflect my values and the values, I think, of most Missourians. My administration will provide very energetic policy reforms. I'll soon start meeting our policy team. Some of the people are here today, actually, covering economic development, education, health care, infrastructure, and civil rights, all of which are crucial. Today I'm going to speak only about two of those. Economic development and education will have plenty of time to have dialogue on the others as the weeks proceed. First, economic development. Our state consistently ranks low when it comes to economic development. My economic policy will be simple. First, we will engage in responsible tax cuts. The cuts will be tied to increases in revenue and reductions in the size of government. My audit teams audit all the state agencies. I know where we can cut millions of dollars. We will return those savings to education and to the people in the form of tax cuts. We will not squirrel away savings for use in pet programs as has been done in the past or more bureaucracy down the road. Those days are over. Now, how are we going to reduce the size of government? First, we're going to improve our huge unwieldy tax credit program, the biggest in the whole country, in real dollars, while still keeping incentives for low-income housing, historic renovation, the redevelopment of abandoned properties, and other areas where we have tax credits. My audits provide a full roadmap for these kinds of savings, and you can see them if you read the audits. We will eliminate fraud and waste in our welfare, child care, and entitlement programs, which is rampant. Uh, and I will be a tireless advocate for companies that are considering Missouri as a home for their businesses. I spent 20 years in the private sector. I have a lot of energy, and I know how to close a deal. To facilitate cost savings, the day of the inauguration, we are going to roll out the Missouri Government Efficiency Initiative, which will provide strong professional and financial incentives for state employees who find specific ways to reduce costs in their agency. One of our state agencies actually has this program, something like it in place. And when we audited it, they said, well, that's different. We don't like that. I said, no, we do like that. We want everybody to do that. And so that's what we're going to do when I become governor. Now, let me say a very critical word about a critical part of our economy, agriculture. I, I spend about 1,000 miles a week in a car. I'm in rural Missouri a lot. Two-thirds of our audits are in rural areas of Missouri. We have 100,000 family farms in Missouri. We are in the top 10 producers of pork, soybeans, corn, and several other crops. Our state literally produces food for the world. But it's more than that. You know, those of you who know me know I read a lot of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson found farming to be the backbone of America, not just because of its economic importance, but because of its social importance. Jefferson admired the self-sufficient, noble farmer making his or her living off the land, free from clutter and temptation. He felt that agriculture reflects everything that's great about our country, and I agree. I promise to be the most pro-agriculture governor in the history of Missouri. I will work tirelessly. I will work tirelessly to protect a successful industry from out-of-state interference. It ain't broke. We don't need to fix it, but the Schweik administration will protect it. Next, education. Between the school transfer law, new forms of accreditation, and various court decisions, our, economic, our education policy is a mess. My administration will bring coherence and effectiveness to that policy. First, we're going to increase education funding with the funds generated by our government efficiency initiative. Second, my policy will be focused on two words, decentralization and choice. We will give broad leeway to individual schools to develop and execute curriculum that suits their needs and the needs of their students. We will encourage students to go into science and engineering while also preparing students who are not college bound for marketable technical skills. I actually think my electrician my plumber and my auto mechanic, based on the bills I got this week, probably make more money than I do. So for some, education and technical skills will help avoid the vicious cycle of college debt uh, from predatory for-profit diploma mills. We're going to crack down on them uh, so they don't sell their diplomas like snake oil to unsuspecting students. We will encourage and elaborate upon legislation, some of it's pending already, that accredits elementary and secondary schools individually. We'll give those students who are in failed schools a chance to transfer to better schools in their own districts. And if that doesn't work, will allow them to go to nearby better schools. And if that still doesn't work, I will work very closely with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education 
and the Missouri Teachers Association to develop public-private partnerships for localized education and job training. We also have 500 school districts in Missouri. This is the kind of thing an auditor knows. Um, the Schweik administration will provide strong economic incentives for the voluntary consolidation of some of those districts, which will save tens of millions of dollars, all of which will go right back into educating our children. And we will support charter schools under more rigorous standards than currently exist because, quite frankly, some of those have failed recently, too, and they need to have very tough standards as well. My policies will, of governor will be clear and coherent. They will be executed with speed and precision. That's my motto in the auditor's office, speed and precision. Responsible paid-for tax cuts, responsible tax credits, a strong agricultural community, improved government efficiency, education based on local needs and school choice, and a persuasive governor with tireless energy who will spend every working day bringing better jobs into this state. The third qualification I want to talk to today is integrity. Now, I do not claim to be any sort of an angel. In fact, I'm not sure that word has ever been used to describe me. Uh, but I'm far from perfect, and I'm sure I'll make mistakes as the campaign proceeds. But I do adhere to a rigorous code of professional conduct, and I demand the same from those working for me. Now, I've been in Jefferson City for four years now, and I do not like what I see. For this reason, as soon as I'm sworn in as governor, I will seek to form the Missouri Accountability Commission. This commission will be bipartisan. It will bridge the oversight gap between the political and the official activities of elected officials. Here will be its charter. One, develop a legislative package to limit the influence of money on politics consistent with the First Amendment. Now, it has to be more than campaign contribution limits. Everybody likes to say that because it sounds so easy. But we already know there's so many ways around campaign contribution limits with independent and multiple political action committees um, and self-funders. Our package will close the loopholes. Here's one idea I'm looking into. Limit how much a candidate can receive from a donor as a percentage of total contributions rather than how much a contributor can contribute. Today, I'm taking a simple pledge that in any calendar year, no individual or corporate contributor, directly or indirectly through an action committee, will account for more than 25% of the political money I receive. Now think about that for a minute. Think about it. This unique proposal forces a candidate to go out and show that the candidate is not controlled by one person or company. It prevents any public official from being bought and paid for. When I'm governor, I will seek to have that 25% limit put into law. And by the way, that's a pretty high limit. And I think over the course of every two-year election cycle, we can reduce it till it's down to 10%. I'm going to voluntarily adhere to the 25% standard until we get into law. And I challenge all statewide candidates from both parties to take this pledge. It should not be that difficult. As I said last year, I was the only statewide candidate on the ballot, and my largest donor contributed only 11% of the money I received. For those candidates who won't take a 25% pledge, I can tell you right now that they're bought, and they should not hold public office. <laughs> Second, the Missouri Accountability Commission will work on legislation that requires every public official to have a published ethics policy dealing with conflicts of interest, nepotism, cronyism, and compliance with Missouri's open records law, integrity in contracting, and taking contributions from individuals or corporations who have a direct interest in legislation. Finally, the Missouri Accountability Commission will study the relationships between contributions and official action. They'll investigate if a bill got killed soon after its opponents made campaign contributions to a key legislator, and I know that happens because it happened last year a few times. They'll see if a case got dropped after the Attorney General received a contribution. They will be authorized to send action letters to public officials identifying potential conflicts of interest and asking the officials to respond publicly and in writing to appearances of impropriety. The issue of ethics and accountability will be a key issue in the campaign, maybe the key issue, because no coherent policy can come out of a legislature or a governor's office that is beholden to special interests or individual donors. My opponents in both parties have very serious questions to answer. Let me start first with my own party. Catherine Hanaway has been running for an entire year. She was running for 2016, even as our party had important races to win in 2014, putting her own interests above those of our party. That was a bad start. But there was another problem. Her campaign simply did not get off the ground. Her fundraising was among the worst in the history of modern governor's races. So she sought and received a bailout from St. Louis billionaire Rex Singfield, who has pumped over $1 million into her floundering campaign and made that campaign entirely dependent upon him with a $10,000 check he writes almost every Tuesday. 
As you can see from the screen behind me, and it should not be any surprise, the reaction has been the same from everywhere around the state. She's bought and paid for. Mr. Singfield's trying to buy himself a governor. Catherine Layaway, one organization wrote a, published a cartoon that is so harsh I won't even quote it. But it's not just the mainstream media that's warned us about the ownership of a governor candidacy by a large St. Louis political machine. Religious conservative groups, veterans groups, and tea partiers have all said they do not want Hanaway and her billionaire patron from St. Louis running our state. From St. Louis to Columbia, Springfield to Kansas City, from the most liberal to the most conservative organizations, no one wants this machine to take over the state. But why is there so much hostility toward the Singfield machine? It is a combination of their corrosive tactics and their bad policies. First, their tactics. Singfield has bragged about having, quote, a political army, unquote, of lawyers, lobbyists, consultants, and politicians on his payroll. He said in an interview that his paid political army consists of a thousand people. A thousand people. They have 115 political action committees and have, in the last five years alone, funneled over $37 million among candidates and committees. They have sunk huge sums into challenging safe incumbent Republicans with brutal primaries just because these good conservatives did not vote their way on one single occasion. They have funneled money through unions to Democrats. They've sued the state auditor, me, 11 times with frivolous lawsuits just to hinder my efforts to provide honest information to the voters. And the reason I know they're frivolous is they've lost every single one of them. They've tried to introduce legislation that could curtail my powers as your state auditor and taxpayer watchdog. When I asked the state legislator who sponsored that legislation, why would you want to cut back on the authority of Missouri's taxpayer watchdog, he said, quote, because Rex asked me to, unquote. <laughs> he admitted he had not even read the bill. The same field machine clearly exercises tremendous influence and control over members of the state legislature, some members of the state legislature. They funneled money through a political action committee to try to buy a key court in Missouri. The PAC denied it, but the campaign finance records showed otherwise. They were caught red-handed trying to buy members of the media, which caused an outrage across the state. They are sending your neighbors information about your voting habits, giving voters grades, a billionaire giving voters grades. Rush Limbaugh, a Republican, called it voter shaming, and a Democrat commentator called it just plain creepy. Now they've propped up a governor candidate who has no base of support. Recently, parts of the Hanaway machine set up a fraudulent Facebook page, specifically designed to look like my Facebook page. They then friended my supporters and led them to false information about my service to our country in Afghanistan. Facebook took the page down for fraud. Hanaway then hired a lawyer or, or put uh, in, in her team a lawyer who has been suspended by the Missouri Supreme Court for unethical conduct. He's now harassing my supporters with letters telling a dizzying series of lies. Nothing is too dishonest for them, and apparently nothing's too petty for them either. It is corrupt, and there's a lot more corruption going on in that camp that we will be talking about in the days to come. The Singfield machine wasted $300,000 on a blimp flying over Jefferson City, just to sort of remind you that they're there. The blimp, as strange as it was, actually kind of gave me an idea. I think Rex Singfield ought to buy the St. Louis Rams. He already has the blimp, and then everybody's going to like him. <laughs> That's my opinion. So one reason people are concerned about this machine taking over the state is the tactics. Buying members of the legislature, buying the governor, buying the courts, buying the media, attacking safe incumbent Republicans, funneling money through unions to Democrats, hiring suspended attorneys, setting up fraudulent Facebook pages, and shaming our voters. Do you like that? No. I don't either. But the policies are even worse. The Singfield machine says they want to eliminate the state income tax, but that's misleading. Their filings with my office say they want to replace the income tax by doubling your sales tax. Some economists say their proposal would actually triple your sales tax. This has outraged retailers, accountants, plumbers, electricians, realtors, and others who would have, have to add up to 22 cents for every dollar of goods or services that you buy. This effect of this tax shift would be to put the tax burden squarely on small business owners and middle-income Missourians. My administration will do responsible, paid-for tax cuts. The St. Field Hanaway ticket is about risky tax shifts away from the wealthy and onto middle-income Missourians. Their education policy is also highly problematic. The centerpiece of the whole policy is to eliminate teacher tenure. They want to coerce teachers into improving. Voters rejected their ballot initiative that did last fall by a 76% margin. We don't need a billionaire in a mansion telling every hardworking teacher in Missouri that when I'm in charge, you will never have job security. My education is about choice and local control. Theirs is about threats and coercion. This is why there's such hostility to the Singfield machine. 
This is not an army of patriots. It's an army of mercenaries. Our campaign is about Missouri. Theirs is about money. We are about policy. They are about power. We are about transparency. They are about trickery. We are about convincing. They are about coercing. Our Republican heroes from Abraham Lincoln to Ronald Reagan would be rolling over in their graves if they could see the Singfield Hanway machine. These are not Republicans. They are Rex Republicans. And if, the, if they run our state, we won't have to have a debate about whether it's Missouri or Missouri. It'll be Missouri X. You have my word that as long as I can stand on these two feet, I will fight to keep the Republican Party from becoming the Rex Republican Party, and I will fight for both Missouri and Missouri so we don't have to live through the misery of Missouri X. <laughs> Now let me say a few words about the only announced Democrat candidate, Attorney General Chris Coster. Last year, an avowedly liberal newspaper, the New York Times, had a banner front page story about how some attorney generals across the United States either dropped or compromised investigations after getting campaign contributions from the companies that they were investigating. And the poster child for selling his office to contributors was our own Chris Coster. He compromised cases against Five Hour Energy Drink and Pfizer, among others, in exchange for contributions. That should be no surprise. When I audited the Attorney General's office two years ago, we found that he was illegally controlling the award of huge state contracts worth millions and millions of dollars to personal injury law firms that had contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to his campaign. We forced him to cancel those contracts, but he only canceled them because we had caught him red-handed engaged in illegal conduct. So Hannaway is bought and paid for, and Coster is clearly for sale. But here's another really interesting twist on all this. As I've been crisscrossing the state meeting with grassroots activists and contributors, many of them, very smart and successful people, have told me they believe that Singfield is really for Coster, not Hanaway for governor. And I was kind of skeptical when I heard that, but then they showed me some facts. Singfield has given Coster, directly or indirectly, through his many packs, $480,000. Rex Singfield is not only Hanaway's biggest individual contributor, he's also Chris Coster's biggest individual contributor. Coster has very close relationships with Singfield and his senior advisors and meets with them frequently. You know, Senator Claire McCaskill recently said that Catherine Hanaway cannot salt her meat without checking with Rex Singfield. Do you remember that? Well, it looks to me like Chris Coster can't pepper his potatoes without checking with Singfield. <laughs> now, here's where it gets really interesting. Last April, just after Singfield made his first down payment of $150,000 on the Hanaway candidacy, Coster supporters started calling the political media, saying they had it on good authority that Sinkfield was actually with Coster secretly. Then on April 3rd, after the Sinkfield machine had started giving huge checks to Hanaway, Sinkfield's political director sent out a tweet indicating that Mr. Sinkfield would be supporting people like Coster in 2016. They quickly deleted the tweet, but I, I've gotten a little text said. I took a screenshot, and we have it. Then a few weeks, weeks later, Sinkfield wrote an editorial for Forbes magazine, Again, after he started contributing to Hanaway for governor, and whom did he rave about as a new generation of enlightened governor candidates? Chris Coster. He did not even mention Hanaway. The Singfield people may be chess players, but they are not very good at poker because I think they tipped their hand. It is widely believed that Singfield, or maybe just some of his advisors, are propping up the weak Hanaway campaign just to help Coster win. Whatever their intentions may be, it's clear that the relationships between Singfield, Hanaway, and Coster are very close. The parts in this machine are almost interchangeable. Finally, let's talk about the last quality you need in a governor, one which has been sorely lacking of late. A governor has to be able to communicate effectively. I plan to be the most communicative, open, and accessible governor in Missouri history. Now, I am a little geeky, I admit that, but I think Missouri is ready for a governor who's about substance. We could use a governor who's not scripted by pollsters, who does not look so slick on TV, but who speaks and looks and acts like a normal person. Don't you think Missouri will appreciate a hardworking, highly qualified geek in the governor's mansion? I know Kathy does. Now, we face a lot of obstacles. Our opponents have unlimited cash, a huge political army of mercenaries. They're not bound by ethical standards or honesty, so they actually have more options than we do. But we have advantages, too. We have an army of patriots, not mercenaries. We have honest government on our side. We are right on the issues. We are not dependent on the whims of one person and boatloads of his money. And most of all, I have complete confidence in the people of Missouri. They're smart. They can see through a scam. They do not want, person, want one person from St. Louis running the state through bad money, bad policy, threats, double dealing, lawsuits, fraud, and attempts at intimidation. As long as we work, work overtime to get the message out, the people of Missouri will support the best candidate, and I am confident we will prevail. My administration will be about helping teachers and students, 
improving conditions for small business owners and factory workers, protecting our agricultural industry and culture, creating opportunities for low-income Missourians, and ensuring that government from Jefferson City to our counties, to our cities, to our schools and courts is effective, honest, independent, and accountable. I am so honored that you came here today. I am so honored to serve the people of Missouri. I wake up every day with a spring in my step just for the privilege of serving you. I am ready to hit the ground running and look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail. God bless you. God bless this country. God bless this state. And let's go out there and win. Thank you. Thank you.